Welcome to our Blue Christmas service here at First Presbyterian Church. I am Pastor Sue Collar, and thank you for joining us for this very special worship service. We have faced an unprecedented loss this year. Families and friends have succumbed to death in this pandemic. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs and had their livelihoods affected by it. Most of us have lost our beloved rhythms of life that give form and shape to our lives and a sense of stability. And of course, we can name so many losses related to hatred and violence this year. Throughout Advent, we proclaim hope, joy, love, and peace. That is God's gift to us this season, this, uh, this promise that the world that we are experiencing right now is not the end all and be all. It is not the way God intends us to live for all time. God is the one who comes to us in the midst of difficulty. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus Christ was born not in a, in a palace and in a temple, but in a, a lowly manger, uh, laid in a lowly manger in a small backwater town of Galilee in the midst of, of struggle and hardship. And so when we come to Christmas, we remember that as much as anything else. And we also recognize that many of us are feeling that hardship and that depression and that difficulty at this time. And so even though we're surrounded by everyone saying Merry Christmas and singing joy to the world and, and even in the midst of this pandemic really stressing you know, what a wonderful time of year it is, we recognize that it may not be that for you. Even apart from this pandemic, some of you are facing your first Christmas without a loved one. Some of you are facing your first Christmas without an income. You're worried about the future and what may happen. So that is why we have the service. This is an opportunity to celebrate Christmas in a way that doesn't ask you to feel something you are not feeling. It doesn't ask you to put on a happy face for everybody else. I don't expect you to leave this worship service feeling any better than you did when it started. You may, I hope you do, but it's okay if you don't. You are not expected to feel anything in this service. This service is just a gift for you to feel whatever you're feeling and to be whatever you need to be right now. So friends, thank you for joining us for our Blue Christmas service. Let us worship God.
friends, please join us in the call to worship. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth, and we have seen his glory. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never been able to extinguish it. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the de desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Both the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and the scripture from Isaiah express the longings of people in darkness for God's light. They do not call us to rejoice in the worldly form of the word, but they call our spirits and souls to reflect on the true hope and joy that only God can give. days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While, there, while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, 
the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom God favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. So that is the classic Christmas story. We have heard it year after year after year in church, on Christmas cards, and in the classic show that many of us grew up with, hearing Linus recite that in A Charlie Brown Christmas. It holds for many of us a warm place in our hearts. But when we stop to think about it, it really is a story that speaks to the depth of human pain. For the child who was born, God in the flesh, entered the messiness of our world and would suffer and die for us. I'd like to share a story with you, another story about the characters who gathered on that very first Christmas. This is by Carolyn Stupin. She was actually a participant in a writing workshop that I took years ago, and she wrote this story, and she's given us permission to share it with you today. It's a story that has stuck with me for quite a few years now because it reminds us that Christmas doesn't always look the same every year. Her story is called simply Nativity. Our nativity set when I was little was of plaster Paris, painted in blues and browns and yellows with gold halos and crowns. Each piece was wrapped in tissue paper so that at Christmas time we took turns unwrapping them one at a time. Baby Jesus was about the size and shape of a sitting-down sheep. You could be tricked. My brother William wanted to be the one to unwrap Clark, the herald angel. I didn't mind, really. You know, shepherd, a wise man. We put the story together piece by piece. It might start out with a couple of sheep and baby Jesus. It could start with Mary and a cow. Then the scene would build and build to include a whole barnyard of animals, a black and two white wise men wearing crowns and fancy robes, two shepherds in tunics holding staff and a lamb. Baby Jesus, as pleased as he could be in his manger, his two haloed parents, and of course, Clark. There was a particular way it had to be set up. The shepherds on the left, the wise men on the right, Clark holding up his banner from above, Jesus right in the middle, Mary and Joseph on either side. There was some play with the donkey and the cow and the sheep, but they were pretty much there on the side of the shepherds. Well, one year our Christmas card picture was taken with us each holding a nativity piece. And every New Year's Day, we wrapped everyone back up in tissue paper again. When we grew up and left home, my mother gave us nativity sets. Little, littler and plastic, but still worthy of being wrapped individually in tissue paper. My father built a sloping backdrop out of fencing slats. My set somehow ended up with four wise men, which I sort of liked. It took me years to ask my sister, who lived an hour away, how many wise men she had, and two she said, but she kind of liked that as well. As my children got older, I became the only one to put up the nativity scene. It felt lonelier now, not so precious. Some years I didn't even get around to putting one up. A few years ago, I went to visit my mother when she was contemplating moving from her home to assisted living. Most of her possessions she didn't care about, 
but she had packed the nativity set and a tiny little suitcase for me. Mom, I've got a nativity set, I said. Why don't you give it to the church? They could use it with the children. Why don't you give it to your church, she answered. Then if you change your mind, you could take it back. So I ended up holding the whole lot of them in my lap at the airport. And at home, they got stored on the shelf next to our other Christmas stuff. At Christmas, I took them down and set them up in front of my father's fence-slashed manger. This was the nativity scene of my childhood. But I was older now. And things were more complicated and changed. I picked up Mary for some reason and set her way out in front so that everyone else was behind her and her calm, contented face was gazing out beyond her own life. Then I took Joseph and set him head to head with the kneeling wise man. They were both close enough and looking down uh, that they could be in each other's presence. I put the kneeling shepherd by Jesus and the black wise man gazing down at the shepherd. I put the sheep and the donkey nose to nose and the third wise man tending the cow. There were so many stories that can happen when you get that many people and animals together. The next Christmas, just Joseph and baby Jesus were the nativity scene. And the year after that, just Clark a wise man, and a cow. It helps me to figure things out, really, taking it piece by piece, wondering what kinds of significant things are happening in the small moments between beings. Tonight we gather, mindful of the losses that have multiplied throughout the year. As we look back at it all at once, we can be in danger of being overwhelmed by it all. All the tragedies, the fires, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the sickness, the death, the violence, and more. Our aim tonight is to acknowledge this, to mourn this, and to know that in the midst of this there is always the possibility of more light. If we are to be overwhelmed, let it be that we are overwhelmed with the assurance that we are not alone. Psalm 36.9 says, 
Within you is the spring of life. In your light, we see light. When we feel as if our light is dimmed, we can rely on the holy light of God to continue to shine until we ourselves are able to shine bright once more. We are not alone. Will you please join me in a litany of losses? Your lines will be prompted. We mourn this night the loss of light. For so many, the pandemic has taken loved ones. We mourn the loss of those close to us and those whose names we do not know. We mourn those who perished while working to save others. We mourn those who died, not of the pandemic, but of other causes. And we mourn the loss, in many cases, of our ability to be with them when they passed our loss of gathering together for comfort in the ways we needed so much. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn this loss of life. We mourn this loss of life. We honor and remember these beloveds. We honor and remember these beloveds. We pray for comfort and peace. We pray for comfort and peace. We mourn this night the loss of livelihoods. For so many, the pandemic has taken away security of food, shelter, care for families, and medical care. We mourn the loss of businesses that could not withstand the circumstances. These were not just businesses, but dreams born of passion and hard work. We mourn those who find themselves needing to rely on others for help when what they really want to do is be able to help others themselves. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn this loss of livelihood. We mourn this loss of livelihood. We honor and remember the dreams now deferred. We honor and remember the dreams now deferred. We pray for sustenance and resilience. We pray for sustenance and resilience. We mourn the loss of love. Our society's dilemma, centuries in the making, has created such hatred, suffering, and oppression and ill will. We mourn the loss of those whose lives were lost to brutality and violence. We mourn the loss of our ability to love one another despite our differences. We mourn the loss of our ability to love one another in spite of our differences that deserve to be celebrated. We mourn the loss of recognition of the inherent beauty and good worth in all people. We mourn that black and brown peoples have perished and suffered in a greater proportion than the pandemic to the coronavirus. We mourn the pandemic of racism that still plagues the fabric of our communities. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn this loss of love. We mourn this loss of life. We honor and remember the work of prophets who proclaim justice. We honor and remember the work of prophets who proclaim justice. We pray for compassion and change. We pray for compassion and change. We mourn this night the loss of liveliness. For so many, this year has robbed us of our energy and our enthusiasm and our sense of well-being. We mourn teachers and leaders and caregivers and workers who are struggling to help those in their care, themselves exhausted and needing the sustenance they give to others. We mourn the loss of all who are suffering with anxiety and depression. 
we're finding it difficult to live each day with fullness or to find hope for tomorrow. We mourn those we have lost to suicide. We mourn those who find themselves addicted to substances in order to ease the pain that feels unbearable. We mourn those who are experiencing their place of shelter as an abusive place from which they struggle to escape. I invite you to repeat after me. We mourn this loss of liveliness. We mourn this loss of liveliness. We honor and remember that each person is precious and whole. We honor and remember that each person is precious and whole. We pray for recovery and renewed vigor. We pray for recovery and renewed vigor. And now we light the fifth candle, just as we will on Christmas Eve. We light this as a sign of our belief. We believe in the light that has come and is coming. This light casts its glow on all the surrounding prayers that we have prayed. This light resides within us, perhaps dim for a while, but always lit, an ember of the holy inside us. This light reminds us we are not alone. <laughs> May the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lived and suffered and died for the sake of all who suffer and hurt yesterday, today, and tomorrow, 
the peace of God which passes all understanding, and the presence of God's Holy Spirit supporting and encouraging you be with you always. Amen. Thank you.